Robert Scott Duncanson was the grandson of a Virginia slave who was taught a trade and freed in the late 1700s, apparently just after the Revolutionary War. He may have been freed because he was an illegitimate son of a white slave owner. Census records reveal that his grandfather and his family made their way north to Fayetteville in the state of New York to escape slavery. There, the artist's father married a Virginia-born woman. Robert S. Duncanson was born in Seneca County, New York in 1821 to a free African-American mother and a Scottish-Canadian father. He spent his early childhood in Canada. The Duncanson family settled in Michigan and established themselves as skilled tradesmen specializing in house painting and interior decorating. Duncanson left the family business around 1840 and moved to Cincinnati, considered the artistic mecca of the West. When Robert S. Duncanson was maturing as an artist and living in Cincinnati, the city was a hotbed of discussion on slavery and emancipation, and it was a central point for the Underground Railroad. Throughout the decade, Cincinnati had been considered a safe place for freed slaves, even though it kept solid economic ties to the South. In 1841, Duncanson moved to Mount Healthy, 15 miles north of Cincinnati, and probably it's thought that he moved there after seeing the city's most notorious race riot. You're looking at a painting that he made around that particular time. This is 1841, roughly, and the name of this painting is called Mount Healthy, Ohio. So it gives you a little bit of an opportunity to see his early style. And I want you to really pay attention to everything in this particular painting because you, I want you to be able to compare it to the last uh, paintings that you will see of his. And so, again, I want you to look at everything, the trees, the sky, and look at the people. Find the people in this painting and see how small they are. By 1842, Duncanson had exhibited in Cincinnati's area while establishing himself as one of the first African-American artists to gain international recognition. Again, this is 1842, so this is his early age, early stage of his life, of his painting. Here's another painting, and one of the things that young painters or emerging artists is what they're called, often paint or draw, is they paint what's called still lifes. And that's what you're looking at here called Rose's Fancy Still Life, 1842. Duncanson also worked in a daguerreotype studio produ producing photographic portraits while teaching himself to paint portraits and copy prints. Some of his early work, as you can see here, is very crude and very primitive. And it shows his lack of training. Again, I want you to pay attention to this particular painting so that you can see how he progressed. And of course, I try to make sure that I get these images in chronological order. There is no date on this, but um, again, we can look at the rocks, the water, the trees, and then find that small person in the painting. And you can see that, yes, he's, this, is, this is his early, early stages. Throughout the 1840s, Duncanson traveled between Cincinnati, Monroe, and Detroit. In 1845, he went to Detroit in search of commissions and painted portraits of prominent Detroit citizens, such as Henry Bartlett and this painting of his young grandson, William. He maintained a studio in downtown Detroit and advertised his talents in a Detroit free press. Before his departure in 1846, the Detroit Daily Advisor commented well on Duncanson's painting skills. The artist returned to the area many times, making Detroit and Cincinnati his primary resident, residence. This, again, name of this painting is William Bartlett. This is 1846, so we get an opportunity to see some of his early uh, portraits. And we can see that it's pretty much in that kind of traditional portrait style. If we had to compare it, 
to uh, Johnson's work, we can see that there's nothing in this in the young boy's hands. Um, they're just simply nicely positioned on his body. It's kind of a darkish kind of painting. Again, he is, you can tell that he's early in on working with his drapery. In 2005, this rare painting owned by the Jesuit community at the University of Detroit Mercy was found in a dusty basement. It's signed by Duncanson and dated 1846, a year when he is known to have worked in Detroit. The artist executed this religious subject during his formative years. Like so many emerging artists, he underwent experimentation. And we could see that in the paintings we've looked at thus far. We could see his experimentation with landscape. We saw it in the, in the waterfall. We saw it in William. Um, and we see it with this painting called At the Foot of the Cross. Um, there's been a lot of research done about this painting. And of course, the discovery of the painting provides further insight into Duncanson's developing skills. When we look at this particular painting, for instance, and we compare it to William, this has a very kind of cartoonish feel to it. We could see that he's still involved with that light and darkness and letting the light come out of the darkness. But when we look at her form, we can tell that it is not, he's not quite aware of the human anatomy. And so it has, again, that very kind of um, cartoonish feel to it. William Lewis Sontag, the leading American romantic landscape painter, and Duncanson had studios next to each other in Cincinnati. Under Sontag's influences, Duncanson began to paint landscapes like the one you see here. This is called Scottish Highlight 1848. And you can see by this painting that a lot has changed. If we compare this to the the Holy was it Holyoke um painting of of um again a landscape in a building, we can see that he has it's brighter, there's more color right? The color is way more complex. The um, foliage that we see, the trees, the bushes, they are all, uh, they don't look the same, right? They all have their own individual characteristic, even though they might be similar species. Um, we see clouds that are pink and yellowish and a sky that's not just blue, right? So we can see that he is really learning and his relationship with Sontag is very important. To improve his painting and to improve his skills, he painted landscapes of the Ohio River Valley and the Hudson River School style to improve his technique. The Hudson River School of Painting, it was established as early as 1825 when William Cullen Bryan and other poets called on artists to paint the wilderness as a symbol of the American nation. So. The last painting you saw was called Winter from 1848, and this one is called Summer from 1849. And again, we can see Duncanson's skills are just improving. He must be painting all the time, and he's really learning a lot. And even his people, which are very small, which tells us these people aren't as important. They're not as important as the landscape. So but the people are even, though they're tiny, they're even more distinct. We can tell man, we can tell woman, right? We can see um, pointing, we can see activities. And then, of course, this incredible, the trees. Look at the trees. Each tree is different, right? Look at the foreground. Look at the background. We have to remember that Duncanson is a self-taught artist who relied heavily upon commissions from wealthy Cincinnatians and abolitionists, especially this man called Nicholas Longworth, Cincinnati's major art patron and lawyer. This was painted in 1858. This is a life-size portrait of Nicholas Longworth, one of the wealthiest entrepreneurs in the country who helped establish Duncanson's career through large commissions such as this one. By 1850, Longworth described Duncanson as, and I quote, one of the most promising painters and a man of great industry and worth. 
The commission involved a suite of eight landscape murals that was rediscovered in 1930 under layers of wallpaper. The murals were created on the walls in the foyer of Longworth House, Belmont, now the Taft Museum of Art in Cincinnati, Ohio. Duncanson's creatively combined the elements of American mural decor with European pictorial wallpaper and contemporary landscape painting. Wealthy Americans wanted to imitate frescoes that were found in European estates to denote their social status. Each of the paintings that you see here measure nine and a half feet by six feet and they are all framed by a painted scroll meant to fool the eye. Together the eight paintings are the largest and best existing pre-Civil War domestic mural decorations in the United States. Patrons like Longworth felt at ease with Duncanson's Hudson School river-derived landscapes and, and specifically enjoyed the lack of overt attention to racial issues within his work. After completing the murals, which challenged Duncanson's technical capability because of their vast scales and complexity, the artist's career was formally launched. He then opened up his studio. Duncanson's still life paintings are rare. Only seven canvases are known today. From 1848 to 1850, he created paintings for the home of his patron, Nicholas Longworth. Longworth was not only a lawyer, a significant patron of the arts, but one of the finest horticulturists in America. He played a major role in the commercialization of grapes and the cultivation of strawberries. So you can imagine this still life from 1849 shows a painting owned by a very wealthy person who could own these various um, fruits, which would have been considered very exotic at that time. Duncanson exhibited his fruit still life paintings at state fairs and art exhibits in Detroit, Cincinnati, and New York during the late 1840s and the 1850s. None of Duncanson's still lifes focuses on grapes. Instead, they're painted in the fashion of the most of most still lifes of that period. He included a, a variety of foods. He has apples, grapes, oranges, raisins, nuts, pineapples, and honeycombs. The last two items were considered really exotic and often were included in Victorian still lifes. In the South, for instance, the pineapple was a symbol of hospitality. So again, as I said, when you, if you went into this house and saw this particular kind of painting, it told you that the person who owned this painting was a very wealthy person because they were able to have these fruits. They were able to give these fruits to their painter, to the person who made this painting, right? They could provide these fruits for them to paint. And these fruits would have been growing, um, they would have been grown in different parts of the world, right? Pineapples at that time were not grown uh, in the U.S. So um, that would have been, the pineapple would have been a, an exotic thing that you didn't see um, quite often. The Hudson River School was a group of artists who painted romantic images of America's wilderness, untainted by man. Like this large, calm, serene painting entitled Blue Hole and or Floodwaters. The sky is cloudy and reflected in the pond. A closer look reveals several fishermen in the central foreground. This picturesque area is in what is now part of John Bryan State Park near Yellow Springs, Ohio. This is considered this is considered Duncanson's masterpiece. It's here that his this is from 1851. It is here that he 
is much more of a master of his craft. We see things that we've not seen in his landscape before. I've talked about the trees, but one of the things that he has dealt with, and they talk about it in your textbook, it's what's called aerial perspective, where he gives the feel that there is space or deep space further in the back where the trees and the clouds meet. There's this kind of fogginess, right? We call that aerial perspective. It's not, in cl it's not clear. It's kind of out of focus, right? So he becomes aware of these techniques that landscape painters um, utilize to create the vastness of the landscape. But that's what the Hudson River School is about. They're, they, the type of paintings that artists make in this particular style, the landscape landscapes are grandiose landscapes where if there are people in those landscapes, they're very tiny like the ones that you see here. And again, I would say to you that he's, he's involved in this style. He's aware of this style. And all of the paintings we've seen where there's a landscape and there's people, those people have improved, right? They have some sort of characteristics. But again, we don't look at them. We have to kind of you know, find them. You have to look at this painting long enough to find these people. They're insignificant. The most important thing in this type of painting is the environment, the landscape, the trees, the water, this beautiful organic thing. And Duncanson has been able to capture this. He's been able to capture this. Um, I was trying to remember, um, I think, the other thing about the Blue Hole, if I'm not mistaken, is that it was part of the Underground Railroad. Somehow, I sort of remember that it being some part, uh, it, it's having this reputation for 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 black people right for people who were enslaved that they knew about this particular place and so it was part of um or part of of the underground railroad in some way the hudson river school landscape paintings often include some sort of moral message or literary association. There are two types of compositions. There's the panoramic view um, that we just saw, and then there's the vertical forest interior. And those are the two types of compositions that the Hudson River School artists use for their landscapes. This particular one is much more of your vertical forest look. And the name of this painting is called the Stone Bridge. Um, and for those of you who've taken um, modern art history, when you look at the stone bridge, hopefully it would remind you of some of the impressionist painters uh, and realist painters like Manet, right? Um, who um, made paintings about the stone bridge or there was some sort of stone bridge, water and bridge in it. Um, the thing that's fascinating to me about this particular painting, again, is the atmosphere. Look at the clouds. Look at the sky. Look at that kind of cloudy, yellowish kind of misty stuff that's in the air. We see it in the landscape. He's really, his colors, his palette has shifted. He's learning about colors. He's learning about how the air, the sky, the light affect those colors. Luminism is another form of the Hudson River School. When the sky consumes a large part of the canvas area, the painting shifts from this sort of theatrical narrative to symbolism. And we see it again in this particular um, painting called Landscape from 1851. There's a certain kind of illuminating sky. Um, we can see that he has us. It, it, it also seems to me that in this particular painting, for instance, that maybe he is relying on his source material. This looks like that he wasn't there at that particular place, but that he's looking at some sort of print. And I say that because his this is 1851 and his trees look very similar to his old trees. They don't quite look as natural. The mountain in the back doesn't look at doesn't have a natural look. As some of his other paintings and I want you to pay attention to that as well it's a little flatter 
the colors are not as richer. Many believe that Duncanson's paintings had a double coded message for both black and white, as the blue hole for blacks speaks of freedom. In 1849, George M. McCurry escaped slavery and settled in a small community in Miami County, Ohio. This county was well known to blacks at the time. The name of this painting that you're looking at is called Landscape with Shepherd, 1852. And so when, when we think about his paintings being double coded, again, we need to think about the time. 1852 slavery is happening. We're in the antebellum period. So when you think of this particular painting and you look at this painting and you think about that um, there are slaves, right? And this is in the South. This is Ohio. So Ohio is not technically in the South, but, uh, you know, I'm from the Midwest, so I have like a biasness against Ohio. Forgive me, those of you who are listening. But so you have people who are enslaved. And so for an enslaved person to see this particular painting, it could be that they see it as a form of freedom. Because when you look at landscapes and you think about it, you're looking at landscapes. Landscapes are about the freedom of nature. It's about looking at this beautiful vastness right? The sky, the clouds, those things you cannot enslave. And so the landscape for the, the, the slave, enslaved African, African American, it could be a form of freedom. And in this particular case, you start looking at it, you see a sky that's kind of cloudy, right? You see the sunlight bursting through the clouds. And then at the bottom, you see lamb or sheep. And notice that the lamb or sheep or whatever animal it is, right? Notice I say sheep or lamb, right? Those are considered um, precious. They're considered uh, like children, right? And so they also are associated, if you're a Christian, with Christianity, right? With, with Christ. And so if someone is religious, for instance, instance and they see this, they could think of... of of these lambs as a form of freedom, of, 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 of youngness, of newness, right? And so this whole experience becomes a, looking at this landscape become this sort of religious freedom. Again, this is called Landscape with Shepherd, 1852. This is one of the few times when Duncanson painted a black person. Abolitionists were inclined to commission works specifically about African Americans. Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, was written in 1852. It was very popular in the anti-slavery community. Abolitionist James Francis Canova commissioned Duncanson to create the painting Uncle Tom and Little Eva. Critics focused on the subject. One Detroit press Call one Detroit Free Press called the work Uncle Tomatude. Even Duncanson said he was uncomfortable with the subject. The subject was attractive to the antebellum whites that slaves love their masters more than their families. And you may say, if Duncanson was uncomfortable with this theme, why did he paint it? Um, this is painted in 1853. Um, again, Uncle Tom's cabin was was written in 1852 and so obviously uh as i said this was a commission piece uh probably by an abolitionist um you can tell that he's not that happy with it because his style look at his landscape it looks like something that he may have done in his studio it also looks like that he didn't put a whole lot of time and energy in it um the figures are fairly large when we compare them to the landscape. In this case, this is not in the, in the uh, Hudson, River Scott, uh, R Hudson River Valley style. Um, the landscape looks thrown together. It looks like he doesn't have enough paint. Um, it's and, and I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. I won't go into it. Um, if you want to go there, you can. Um, you could look at this painting and see that 
it is problematic not only from its subject matter from that time but just in terms of looking at his style and seeing how he um i would just say you know you can tell now if he likes something or not right he's painting this for money and not for um it's not going to help him anyway the year 1853 was an important one for Duncanson. On April the 26th, with the financial assistance of Nicholas Longworth, he left Cincinnati for Europe with William Lewis Sontag, his studio mate and friend. With the help of the Freedmen's Aid Society of Ohio, Duncanson traveled to places such as Glasgow and Scotland to study painting. This trip was unprecedented as Duncanson was the first African-American artist to break through the racial prejudice of the art world and undertake the, what's called the Grand Tour of European Art Centers, a route that led him to paint landscapes in London, Paris, Rome, Florence, Italy, and the Swiss Alps. In a letter to a friend, he stated, and I quote, of all the landscapes I saw in Europe, and I saw thousands. I do not feel discouraged. End of quote. The name of this painting is called The Quarry. And this is 18, between 1856, 1853, I'm sorry, and 1863. Um, we can look at this particular painting again, and we can see that at this particular time he is traveling, he's making these paintings, and we, you know, I would say to you that he may not have had a lot of time, right? So now is he doing, uh, is he painting on the site or is he making little watercolors or little studies and then going back to his studio? I suspect he's going back to his studio and he's making, um, making these little paintings. And I say this because I see that he repeats certain elements in his paintings in terms of looking at his greenery right and looking at his at looking at his rocks when he has a time when he has time to be in the environment it seems to me that there's more variety in the value of the of the colors that he utilized in his landscapes especially when they're very rocky like the quarry Once back in Cincinnati, around 1854, Duncanson made a living by retouching and coloring portraits by James Presley Ball, the black daguerreotyper who owned the best-known art studio in the Ohio River Valley. Also, Duncanson exhibited paintings of ancient ruins based on his international travels in James P. Ball's gallery, and this is one of them. This was um, this is called Pompeii from 1855. Um, again, notice that he paints Pompeii again in, in that um, Ohio River Valley style. We see the landscape, again, is really important. And then we have small images or small um, views of the people as well as the ships and boats. So they're not important. What's important is the Mount Suvius who's smoking in the back as well as the um, ancient artifacts that we see here at Pompeii. Duncanson also began painting portraits of prominent white abolitionists from Detroit and Cincinnati. His portraits include James G. Barney, editor of The Philanthropist, an abolitionist newspaper, and of Lewis Case, who was an abolitionist senator from Michigan. This is uh, Friedman Gary, and this is from 1856. Um, the interesting thing to me about this particular painting is I noticed that the hands of uh, this Friedman are very similar to William's hands. Uh, in this case, notice he has something in his hand. He has a document in his hand, and we could see that um, Duncanson utilizes some of the same um tricks that um Johnson did and we can notice this in the background we have this kind of fake um background setting of books right and then the window so we're looking at all these symbols around him that talk about him being a learned kind of man 
Duncanson's subjects came from diverse sources, such as literary, biblical, and of course his travels. The name of this particular painting is called Remembrance of a Scene Near Arabach, and this is from 1856. Again, this is from one of his trips, his visits. Um, the other thing that I need to talk a little bit about is, is, is Duncanson's own internal voice, right? So when we look at this painting, right, I think that the other part, that Duncanson himself is obviously getting something from this environment. He is in this environment, it's 1856. Again, this is the antebellum period. This is the time of abolitionists talking about, um, about slavery, talking about how horrible slavery is, and then you have people enslaved. And so he has all his energy around him. So it seems to me that he escapes into the wilderness and the wilderness becomes his temple, right? It becomes his place to learn, right? And so when we look at these hills, the trees, the light, the light in between the clouds, right? That's always been symbolized in Christianity as God, right? God is talking, God is talking to um, nature or God is nature, 